I don't know what the future of this farm is. I really yeah. don't. It's a business with a very thin margin and it's getting thinner. It took a lot of sacrifice. Those are days and days of no sleep <laughs> and, and lots of blood, sweat, and tears. When they say that, that's not just to say. <laughs> that's yeah. really what, what you're giving yeah. to build something like, like a farm. This is the Real Food, Real People podcast. Some people say that it can't be done, but our guests today has done it. A first generation family dairy farm here in Elma, Washington, where we visit with Nora Dolman. She and her husband, Nick, and their family farm 400 cows growing milk for dairy gold here in Western Washington. It's a huge challenge and she shows us how it's done and all of the heart that's gone into it. I'm Dylan Honkoop. This is the Real Food, Real People podcast. We're glad you're here for another episode and get ready to get to know Nora Dolman and everything that goes in to this dairy farm here in Elma, Washington. So Nora. Yes. Thanks for having me to the farm. Absolutely, welcome. So this is it, Nick and Nora's dairy. Yes, it's is the that, dairy. Like, what is the official name of your dairy? It's Elma Dairy. Elma Dairy. Yep. Here in Elma, Washington, yep. which makes sense. But I know you as Nick and Nora's crazy adventure. Well, not really, but <laughs> that's the name on, uh, I know you from on Instagram. Yep, that's right. Well, um, Nick and Nora just sounds smooth. There's a <laughs> old classic movie. Yep, exactly. Nick and Nora, the Thin Man. So yep. yep, we figured that that would be a great Instagram handle, I guess. So we're watching milk being grown right now, right behind us here, right? That's right. Cows eating the feed. Now, talk about what what's happening here. What are they eating? Um, our cows are eating a mixed ration. They've got some grass silage. We put a little alfalfa in that. Um, now, do you guys grow it? You, gr you grow your cow food here? Yes, we grow our own grass silage here. We also make hay and round bales. Um, okay. Yeah. So, and your crop farmers then, as well as cow farmers? Thankfully, yes. That's part of, that's one of my favorite things about farming is the growing the crops for the cows. So talk about how that works. Obviously this is not crop farming season where we're talking right no. now. Yeah, unfortunately not. Um, so probably in April, um, yeah. we'll be out um, cutting the grass, bringing it in and storing it in the silage pits, letting that grass and silo a little bit. It gives it a nice, uh, it breaks it down kind of, I consider it like a fermentation, yeah. uh, kind of like us eating yogurt. So yeah. the girls will get a little bit of um, more nutrient from that grass. I it's call easier it to break down. Sa cow sauerkraut. Cow sauerkraut. <laughs> I make sauerkraut too, and I love it. Yes. Me too. Uh, <laughs> um, at any rate, so yes, we're packing the silage into the pit, and um, we do that all through May till November. Um, in the drier months, we'll make some hay, do mm -hmm. some square bales and some round bales um, that we feed our not milking animals, the, the beef and the um, younger stock. And yeah. So what kind of stuff come crop farming season, since I can tell that you love that part of it. And that that's honestly my part too, because yeah. I'm a lot of dairy farmers are real animal people. And I always have to confess, I'm not a huge animal person. I think they're cool, but I'm- fantastic. I don't have, you, they take a lot of patience and calm to work with. And I <laughs> struggle with, that but i do love the crop farming that's what i grew up around on a raspberry farm oh cool so what do you do then yourself come crop time what what's your role do you turn the dirt do you run the mower do you run the child what, what's your thing to do so we farm in a floodplain so there's not a whole lot of turn and dirt for us we keep a good perennial stand of grass Okay. Um, to is keep... that like erosion and stuff? Yes, to prevent erosion. We don't want the neighbors down the river getting all our dirt. So we like yeah. to keep it on the farm. Um, so we'll have a good stand of grass and then we'll intercede with um, different things that we had. Lately, we've been putting oats into the ground mm. and um, also like clover. 
So oats and clover really flex in the hot, dry season, um, August. So that they're more drought resistant or what's the purpose they, for those? Yes, they're more drought resistant and it adds um, nutrient for the cows, mm. um, also volume yeah. for our, you know, forage, our take home. Yeah. Um, yeah. What about soil health? I've heard of clover and, and oats and stuff being used also to improve soil health. Is that part of the whole thing? Yeah, I think so. Yep. So it's like diverse crops, not just the same one variety of grass yes. everywhere. There you go. Yep. Sort of thing. Yep. So we chop the grass, we'll mow it, rake it, chop it. And then once we're done with the field, we'll let, um, well, in the drier season, not yep. the first cutting, but probably second cutting, we'll um, allow the cows to go out after we've chopped. They'll cut, they'll trim the edges around the, the fence line Just and graze it um, down. yeah, graze it down, aerate the soil a little bit and then they'll move on. We'll have them in there for maybe a week, kind of depending, we'll watch mm -hmm. the grass um, and then we'll move them onto the next field and we apply our manure, we'll let that settle in, uh, grass Nat grows up again and we do it all over again. Natural fertilizer mm -hmm. and the cycle continues. And the cycle the continues. The cows eat it, they poop it out, you put it on the field. Yes. It grows grass. <laughs> Wonderful cycle of life. This, yeah, <laughs> one of the <laughs> cycles of life. Um, thinking about that, why don't you have the cows out there more to roam around and just, why do you have to mow it, you know, to cut the grass down, chop it up into chunks, put it in a pit and then sile it, make sa cow sauerkraut. Why don't you just have the cows out walking around grazing? Well, we can't have them out 12 months out of the year and they would do a number. They'd do some damage on that soil, on that, okay. um, that grass, that root system that we have. So they're up in the barns making the milk. We bring them the feed, um, but also in the nice months, in the optimal months, we'll have um, the cows out chasing the chopper, chasing the harvest crew. So they do pasture some. Mm -hmm. how, many, how much of the year are they able to do that? Um, May till, shoot, we were out till November oh, this wow. year. Yeah. yeah Depending cool. on the weather kind of thing. Yeah. We had a really dry spring last year. So, but yeah, about that. And, and depending on the, on the fields. So what does it take to grow good milk? I mean, you gotta really be worried about the specifics of that grass and you know, the, I know there's lots of testing that can go on sometimes to see like what's in it nutrient wise, just kind of like reading the nutrient label on your cereal box in the morning. Right, absolutely. Um, definitely the age of the grass and of course what nutrients you're feeding the grass. Uh, these girls will turn their nose up at old mature grass. There's mm. just fiber in it. They want the good stuff. They the want lush. the young, yes, the young yep. green lush stuff. Um, so yeah, absolutely the science of it. So, um, I see a lot of black and white cows and that would be Holsteins. Yes. Right? Yes. But you do have a few others in there. I see some brown and white and that's a lot of people think of brown cows and jerseys, but those aren't jerseys. Those, what do we have? Guernseys in here? No Guernseys. Or what we, are they? We have a whole variety. So we started our herd with Holsteins uh -huh. and then we bought, um, we bought some jerseys, really loved them, but bred them to Holstein. Okay. And then my husband got all excited about hybrid vigor. Uh, we want a healthy cow. And yeah. when you're mixing all of the good traits from one breed and another breed and you get them all in one calf and then you can continue that line, it's really exciting. Um, but then he got bored with just Holstein and Jersey. So didn't get so bored that he got to Guernsey. Yeah. Um, so we've got some Mont Billiard. Hmm. Um, we've got Fleck V. And we have some Swiss because the kids showed Swiss. <laughs> yeah. Not a lot of those. Um, a lot of red carriers when we started um, choosing semen for pulled. So we don't want horns. We don't have to deal with that when they grow up or even when they're calves. And if you've got to try to contend with horns. So um, he's been choosing a lot of pulled semen, which means that, yeah, we wind up with a lot of red Holstein, interestingly enough. 
So you talk about the different characteristics, kind of generally what are those that you're looking for in a, in a good cow to grow milk? Yeah, we want her to be healthy. We um, yeah. want her to have a good, strong immune system. We like a lot of cream. We don't need a ton of milk, but we want to have good quality milk and we want her to live a long, healthy life. Uh, we want her to have easy calving. So um, those are traits that you can pick out from, yeah, from, from your selection of sires and um, also the pulled. So overall, you guys are more like quality versus quantity. Yes, here. quality, cream, healthy, yeah. So where does your milk go to then? Like, how would I end up drinking or eating something made out of your milk? Yeah, we're Dairy Gold shippers, so we can mm -hmm. find our milk in every local store in Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Montana. <laughs> Do you know if your milk goes to the fluid milk or which because they have different facilities around Washington State that make different things out of milk from different farms. Yeah. Do you know much about where it goes or it kind of depends on where they need it? I think it kind of depends on where they need it. I'm, yeah. I'm assuming most of ours goes to powder. Yeah. Yeah. Which is the case up um, by us too, because mm -hmm. we have a really big powdered milk plant mm -hmm. in Linden where I grew up. Okay. So that's very much what I'm familiar with. Obviously though, like when you produce milk and you guys being about quality rather than quantity they test the loads right mm -hmm. it's not just milk is milk every load probably has a different test as far as the components of the milk right yes what are those like milk fat is a big thing yes. like how creamy it is basically yeah right? 4.2 is what we're running right now <laughs> it's interesting of fat. so that's you think about it you go to the store and you get whole milk but it's like 3.5 percent or something yours is actually yeah. creamier than whole milk when yeah. it's <laughs> produced that's reduced fat your whole yeah. milk <laughs> yeah exactly so day to day what what is your role on the farm are you you're out here dressed to be out with the cows what what do you do um so in the winter time unfortunately there's no silage, you know, there's no harvesting to do. Yep. Um, so this is kind of my baby, the, the Lely pen. This is um, our newest project. Mm -hmm. It's 130 cows in this pen, mostly first lactation. So uh, I'll come in and I'll fetch the girls that haven't been into the robot when they need to be. Uh, go to the computer, pull a list. Um, they'll be kind of depending on where they are in their lactation they could be six hours out if they're fresh or 12 hours out so bring them up get them into the robot remind them what they need to be doing um also do just kind of light cow care i'm i'm not a cow person i'm a tractor person yeah so you know if she looks you yeah, <laughs> all right totally, totally. <laughs> and you know if her foot looks funky or yeah, also the computer or the robots will read um, certain things from their milk like temperature and other things so I can pull that up. Yeah, in terms of the robots, I remember when I first heard, oh, they're gonna milk cows with robots, and this is years ago. I'm thinking, when I think of a robot, I think of like C-3PO or, yes. you know, something that moves <laughs> around, but this is stationary <laughs> and they walk into it, right? Explain yes. how the robot works. Unfortunately, it does not do the robot <laughs> in the barn. It is yeah. stationary. Yeah. Um, I could do that when I'm pushing the girls up. But you're not a robot. Not unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> um, so explain how it works. Um, yes, it's a room. There's access for the cows to go in. We have two robots and one pen here. Um, girl walks, the cows walk in. The gate will close. It'll read her tag. It pulls up her information. It, um, it remembers the mapping of her udder, where her teats are. Um, and then arm comes in, reads with, has, pulls up the memory, but also reads with a laser um, where her teats are, cleans them, brushes them off, blows them dry. Yeah, we've got a whole spa thing going on. And then um, comes in and attaches and starts milking her. And Just with machines that use suction, I guess, for people who aren't familiar with oh, milking yeah. machines. Yes. They just have what little inflation kind of things that yes. suck onto the teats and draw the milk out. That sounds good. Yep. And the cows, <laughs> the cows are cool with that. They just. Oh, that's the other thing. So she's incentivized and... with grain. Okay. So, so they're robot like, hey, also... we're going to go get a snack. Yes. And while they're munching on their snack. Yes. Obviously it can't be that uncomfortable though. If oh. they're just chilling there while, it, while this machine is taking yeah. care of it. Yeah. Sometimes you got to make them leave. 
Oh, and they're so curious too. My husband's convinced that robots were made for jerseys. Curious, <laughs> you know, cows that just want to get into everything new and novel. Um, so yeah, they come in, they're eating their grain, uh, licking the bowl clean, she gets milked, um, and the robot's taking all that information in, how much per quarter uh, that she's getting milked, what's the temperature, what's that milk look like, um, and then it gets pumped out to a buffer tank and then into the the tank up front for the truck to pick up a little bit later so, and we do it all over again <laughs> crazy how many times how often does a cow go through this robot to be milked our average is 2.7 right now like so. 2.7 times a day yes yes interesting <laughs> but we have a few that are in there like five times and so the robot sees her you they know just like it more because what they want another snack because they're jerseys because they're curious. Do yes, they, get, they want another do snack. Do they get a snack if they go in every time? Or? Uh, well, if they're, if they're, if it's too often, the, the robot will kick her out <laughs> and won't allow her to get that extra little snack. You're like, but, no, you've had enough. Yeah, but if it's decided, you know, it's looking back at her, her, you know, activity and says, well, maybe yeah. she's got ten more pounds or something, she'll let her. The robot will allow her to get milked, and she gets a little bit more snack. <laughs> when did you guys start doing this with this technology? We. We started up our robots in 2020, yeah, and which was great timing because the yeah. kids came home from you know, COVID shut down right. the schools, so we had the kids full time to run robots or run the cows through the robots and yeah. Home, homeschool on the farm with cows. Oh yeah, oh yeah, we did a lot of <laughs> homeschool projects <laughs> that looked like construction and farming. <laughs> What was it like making that shift though? I know that can be a big deal for farms when they go from the old style where you have a person or multiple people who are working with the cows, yeah. actually putting the milking machines on and doing all of that to a robot system. It can be a huge change for how a farm works. Yeah, we cheated for a little while because we continued with our conventional parlor. We ran most of the cows through there and then we had um, two pens of cows into the robots. It was really exciting. I think Nick and I both have a mechanical background. So um, he's, my husband Nick is an absolute cow guy, born and raised in, in dairy farming. Um, but to add the, the robot piece to it was really exciting. It's like two things that he's really, you know, really enjoys. Um, to be able to put that together was kind of neat. So, so automation like why why not just have people do it i guess is one question somebody could ask well in washington state it's really really expensive to have their labor is super expensive mm. so that was a big drive for robots also cow comfort cows love the robots and we really love the idea that they can come in when they please and not that the conventional way of milking is is not a bad way this was just kind of a you know this is right up our alley with technology yeah. and um and mechanics and so yeah we went for it automation automation is that That's the right. way of farming i mean well eventually will a uh, robot go out and cut the grass and make the silage i the, hope the not cow sauerkraut i certainly hope not yeah <laughs> i don't want to lose that part this you, part, like, you think, like that yeah. part that's your favorite i part. will not be replaced by yeah. the way <laughs> by a robot what's your perfect day on the dairy out, uh, in, the, out in the tractor yes. bringing in the harvest silage season absolutely yep a warm sunny day yeah perfect day is bringing in grass about 60 loads just didn't you know yeah and then maybe, well, doing some cow care in the morning, checking on the robot girls, and then out to the tractors and just spending the day in the fields. That's a perfect day. Love driving tractor. Yep, absolutely. Me too. <laughs> I miss that now that I'm not a farmer. <laughs> I'm when sure somebody's kid, hiring. <laughs> well, yeah. And I do pick up odd jobs when I get the chance be like, oh, I can come drive a tractor for a few hours. <laughs> Therapy for me to just sit yes. in the tractor and get stuff done and mm -hmm. turn the radio up, that kind of thing. Yep. But automation being a big thing, this is, I guess you would call this a robot that's scraping the manure. Yeah, so this was a huge thing for us, um, automating the manure, scraping, because like you said, otherwise you'd have 
somebody driving up and down the barns all day long, all of the barns, moving cows from one end to the, of the pen, barn to the other um, out of the way so you can push that manure down into the scrape slot. Um, now we have automatic scrapers. These run four times a day. It's, it's a system that has four alleys. Um, so two are coming down while two are going up and vice versa. Um, we also have a flush system. So we, the manure that comes down into the scrape slot goes into the back of the farm. It's separated from the liquids to the solids. Mm. And that liquid is then pumped up to a tank up above our barns, our other flush barns. And um, then there's automation of uh, some bladder valves that will open to flush the barns with liquid mm. manure. But so, that's recycled water then? It's recycled liquid manure. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And then ultimately that manure becomes your fertilizer for your crops. That's right, that liquid gold. So what do you do with it in the winter time? Like it's being pushed here into a slot, down into a system like you say, mm -hmm. separated probably over there is what I'm seeing where it's taking the solid parts out and yep. separating it from the liquid. Then you've got to store it, right? Yes, we do. Yeah, we've got lagoons that store our manure and then in, um, in the silage harvest season, we'll yeah. start pumping it out onto the fields to grow that grass for the girls. Do you get to do that part too, the manure pumping? <sighs> yes, I get to do that. <laughs> okay, we were all talking about how fun tractors are, yeah. but are they really fun at 0.5 miles an hour? Yeah, it's no, very so slow <laughs> to spread the manure out. Yeah. But that's so important. I mean, yeah, like you important. talk about soil health, right? Oh, like yeah. that's, that's a huge part of it. <laughs> Doing God's work, I know, right? <laughs> it's all worth it. <laughs> Just put on a podcast. <laughs> We're all in favor of that here. Right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Keep the podcasts on. Oh, and you said you have 600 acres of crop yes. farming. And so is that what it takes to feed this many cows or how, how does um, that work? Yeah, well, we pick up extra acreage here and there. Um, the last three years have been really dry. Mm. Uh, we've had super dry um, falls even that have been pretty rough on harvest. So lately we've been purchasing hay. So if we run short, yeah, we got to buy some hay from the east side of the mountains usually. That's probably more expensive than just growing it yourself. Yep. Fun, fun. Yeah. <laughs> Why not? Farming costs money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just a quick time out from our conversation here to thank our sponsors on the Real Food, Real People podcast. These folks make these conversations, this podcast possible. So first, the Dairy Farmers of Washington, big supporters of this podcast and supporters of farms like Nora's here in Elma, Washington, where they do all the things that Dairy Farmers of Washington talk about all the time. WaDairy.org, there are lots of other stories like Nick and Nora Dolman's about producing milk here in Washington state, taking care of cows, stewarding the land. That's what they're all about. Uh, farming dairies in Washington, dairy farmers of Washington, wadairy.org is the website, check it out. Also, Washington Red Raspberries uh, supporting the podcast. A big thank you to them, as well as CHS Northwest, helping farms like this do what they do and also providing a lot of other things to the public with their retail outlets, their fuel, uh, as well as the agronomy and all the different things that CHS Northwest provides. So thank you to those sponsors. Now let's get back to our conversation with Nora Dolman here in Elma. So tell me, how did you come to this world? And this is gorgeous, by the way, out here. All the green, all these, you know, fields that you've been talking about where the grass grows, mm -hmm. like natural way to grow milk, which mm -hmm. starts here in the field, right? But how did you get started in this? Did you grow up around farming? You said your husband did. Yes. Uh I absolutely did not grow up in farming. Hmm. I think my earliest and very minimal experience in farming was a garden, I grew uh, snap peas, yeah. and I was so proud of myself. I think I was second grade, sold them to the restaurant that my mom used to work at. Nice. <laughs> so yeah, that's not 
that's not legit farming, right? So married into dairy, um, my husband's family, uh, dairy farm. So we kind of got into that. that so way. did you grow up in this area? Grew up in Washington State, yep. In, in Washington State. From Spokane, okay. um, but spent most of childhood in uh, Olympia area, Southwest okay. Washington. So not far from here. Nope. But I guess I'm the reason I ask is you grew up with all of this around. How much of it were you aware of before you connected with your husband's family and kind of got into the, the f actual farming? Absolutely none of it. I had no idea. I, <laughs> I didn't even, I don't think I ever thought about where milk comes from or, you know, Mm -hmm. what what it takes to make that milk or yeah. cheese or any other product so totally clueless how how did you and your husband meet oh uh, we met at diesel school uh centralia college we okay. both went yeah so you were yeah what were you planning to do you were going to be a diesel mechanic yep that's what i wanted to really? do <laughs> tell me about that that's <laughs> that's cool uh i just i love mechanicking um and so in high school, I started taking shop classes, really mm -hmm. loved that, um, took some welding classes and um, yep, decided to do diesel. I think, um, not really sure why, <laughs> um, you know, cars, I saw cars are getting a little smaller and yeah. um, a lot of the, the parts on them are super consumable, just you right. know, throw away, cars are becoming throw away parts. Disposable. And, yeah, very disposable, yeah. yeah. But diesels, big trucks, tractors, stuff like that. So at that point, you had to have been thinking about tractors a little bit. A little bit. Yeah, I suppose so. Yeah, I worked in a truck shop. Mm -hmm. um, and you got drawn into the farming world. What was that like at first, being around farming? It was probably kind of like, whoa, this is what you guys do? Yeah, I uh, learned a little bit when we were first uh, dating and first married. But yeah. we, didn't, we didn't get into dairy farming right away. Um, How did you start farming? What were you doing at first when you guys were first together? Uh, Nick and I started dairying in 2008. Um, I remember I was nine months pregnant when we started. Um, a little bit checked out, not super involved in the dairy at that time. Yeah. Um, but what a wonderful way to raise kids. Yeah. Um, they've got all this land <laughs> at their disposal they go out and ride four-wheelers and dirt bikes and things like that and um, of course if you can ride a four-wheeler you can drive a tractor <laughs> so you get put to work. <laughs> they get put to work yeah. um, and they're on the harvest crew for sure um, but yeah no I I learned along with my kids a lot about dairy I don't I don't know everything by any means um so in 2008 you guys decided you wanted to go all in on this farming had you been doing some farming stuff just before that or what were you doing professionally before farming um so you're probably busy having kids yeah too. we were having kids we had a mobile repair service okay doing the mechanical and nick was doing all the mechanical work i'm yeah. raising kids doing the books um and then we decided so at one point i was driving i was on the harvest crew for my father-in-law mm -hmm. so driving tractor learned a lot there um and then yeah 2008 we started milking our own cows we decided to get into it um so is this the family farm that you're continuing on or is this a different farm that you guys no this is not the family farm okay yeah we um nick was raised on a dairy 30 minutes from here okay and his parents still farm there um, but this this was a totally different one owned by somebody else and we were we had the opportunity to get into it and decided to take that chance so they were selling out it was time for them to call it quits and yep what what did that feel like that had to have been to me that sounds really daunting yeah to to take on a, a project if you will and a project doesn't as a term doesn't do it justice a farm is much more than a project it's <laughs> a million projects <laughs> How did you, you had to have been thinking like, what are we doing here? A little bit, yeah. It, I, man, thinking back now, I, I knew absolutely nothing. Yeah. <laughs> I knew absolutely nothing about about the cows and the business side. There's a huge part of it is the business side. Um, you know, of course, thankfully, Nick had all of that experience um, to lean into. And um, yeah, we just took a chance. Why not? <laughs> I guess we're 
It was an adventure. Yeah. And it's Nick still and Nora's has, adventure. Nick and Nora's adventure. <laughs> <laughs> so how did it go at, at first? Like, when did you finally find your groove? Because, I mean, it probably takes at least a couple of years to kind of get into the routines and patterns that a place like this takes. Yeah. Okay. So when we started, we started with a couple hundred cows and we built up to um, about 1,400. And uh, we, we were making a lot of milk. And that was how we were able to uh, pay off debt that mm -hmm. it took to get into the dairy industry. Yeah. And, um, but it, it's, it's a challenge. It's a challenge, especially on the west side and of the state yeah. um, when, you know, your neighbors aren't farmers. <laughs> They're building houses uh, all yeah. up and down the highway from you. So, you know, your field access or opportunities are limited more and more so yeah. um, as your lovely neighbors come in. Um, and then I guess we just decided to change um changed the way we were doing things and um so we sold a bunch of cows and now mm. we're just doing automation with yeah. milking robots uh 400 cows yeah and it's a little quieter yeah. <laughs> but and is that when you kind of decided to go like we talked about earlier quality over quantity sort of approach well i'd like to say that that the milk has always been quality yeah, for sure but um yeah i suppose so yeah you know, you're, you're feeling the squeeze from all angles, whether it's the, the neighbors moving in or the, the cost of everything. Um, we figured it would just be a better fit if we got a little smaller. So how much different is your life now compared to before farming? Is that worth it? Yes, of course it's worth it. Um, farming is for me i get i get to do all the cool stuff you know i get a i get to play with cows and i get to you know mess with the robots i get to be outside outside a lot although you know 14 degree weather yeah. <laughs> in the blowing wind is not all that fun but i love to be able to work outside yeah. and um you know do all the things that we do what's it like to be a woman doing what you're doing as well because it, it, I know there's a stereotype of just like, oh, farm wife or whatever. You're farming just as much as anybody on this farm. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. I guess that I would say, first off, the stereotype is total baloney. Yeah. <laughs> I've met a lot of women in the dairy industry and agriculture, uh, and they, all of us are so different, and we have so many different skills and passions that um, are plugged into agriculture, and we... I don't know. It's, um, there, there can't be a stereotype because yeah. we're you know, all our unique selves. And how is it for me? I don't know. I don't know any different, I suppose. Yeah. Nobody yeah. told me I wasn't supposed to, so I just did it. <laughs> well, and going into like being a diesel mechanic out of high school is not your stereotypical role either. So you're probably used to it from the get-go of yeah, I suppose so. doing something that's unexpected maybe to, to what people have in their heads. I suppose so. Yes. Yeah. I guess I did. Like I said, I didn't know any better. I was never yeah. told we weren't, I wasn't supposed to be doing those sort, sorts of things. I love it. So what does the future hold for this farm? You've got kids that are growing up now. They want to get into it or what's, yeah, what's the trajectory? Oh, I don't know what the future of this farm is. I really yeah. don't. Um, you know, again, it's, it's it's a it's a business with a very thin margin and it's getting thinner hmm. so i don't know i i honestly don't see farming thriving in my area hmm. um for too much longer <laughs> i don't see the future for my kids here unfortunately but you know, am I guaranteed that? No, you know, I'm not a multi-generational farm um, with land that's been passed down for forever. So, you know, I'm, uh, you know practically speaking, you know, what do we deserve? I don't know. We deserve a good hard day's work, yeah. um, hopefully to, you know, build something for our kids. But what that looks like, I don't know. Well, and you guys prove that it's possible too, because for some people it feels or seems or is legitimately too daunting for them to maybe get into farming the way that you guys did yeah but you made it happen and again not 
not like oh hey yeah family money passed down <laughs> you did did the whole bootstrap thing right we certainly did and those it took a lot of sacrifice those are days and days of no sleep <laughs> and and lots of blood sweat and tears when they say that that's not just to say <laughs> that's yeah. really what what you're giving yeah. to build something like like a farm when you say you just don't know what the future is and you don't know about farming in this region, why? What, what's driving that? What's the biggest problem? Well, labor costs and yeah. um, honestly, legislative sessions, it's exhausting going from one session to the other mm. when you hear big, scary buffer bills coming in. I mean, that's something that would take all of this land that we mm. make our feed for our girls it would take everything um the cost of everything which yeah. is affected by yeah. <laughs> regulations and labor um yeah you look over to a, the state right next to us and you know their the cost of labor is half hmm. their fuel cost is you know fraction of what we pay hmm. and everything on the farm takes fuel in one way or another i right. gotta feed the cows well, that's going to take some diesel. I got to make mm -hmm. the feed for the cows. That's going to take the diesel. I've got to do something with my manure. That's going to yep. take the diesel. So, um, yeah, it's it's a high cost of doing business in this state. And but that's it, the reality of where our food comes from then, yeah. too. It costs that much more money to produce the food that we all go to the store and eat. Yeah. What I've been hearing, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but what the farmer gets for the food that they grow isn't really going up. No, that ain't changing, <laughs> that's so for that's sure. So that's down here, but the cost of producing it yeah. keeps going up. Yep. <laughs> what What do you do? How, how are you guys dealing with that? Uh, we pay ourselves a little less every year. Mm. Um, and yeah, we try to, to cut where we can. But, you know, when, you, when, when you're continuing on that, um, pattern. Yeah. What is the future? I don't know. That's scary. Yeah. It's a little scary, but that's life. <laughs> life is scary. <laughs> so if you didn't have this farm, what would you do? Oh, I can't imagine not making food, right? Mm. I would love to stay in agriculture. Um, but I've also lived in Washington state all my life and I love, I love where I live. I love yeah. where I'm from. Um, so I don't know. No. <laughs> that's my problem yeah well thanks for having me out here to the farm and good luck I hope that things change because and I think a lot of people would agree what you guys are doing to grow food and the way that you're doing it is what we need and we don't I don't want to see farms like yours go away <laughs> so that's hard to hear but it's good to hear at least uh, for people to be aware of what's happening so Thank you for sharing that. And thanks for having me here to the farm. Thank you. <laughs> this is the Real Food, Real People podcast. These are the stories of the people who grow your food. 